Hello dear students, in this video lecture, I, Dr. Vinamrita, Assistant Professor from MSKB College, I am going to give you an introduction to what is criticism and what are the phases and ages in which criticism has been divided. So first we have to understand that this word criticism comes from the French word critique, which means judgment. So we have to understand this very well that criticism is the name of judging any piece of art or work of literature. And we have to keep it in mind that criticism is not always negative in sense, but it can also be positive in sense. So it's just mere judgment. You have to find out the good or the negative points of any piece of work of art, but it's not purely negative in nature. It's not necessarily that anything which is being mocked or which is ridiculed is criticism. But criticism is judging the merits and demerits of anything on equal scale of or in any piece of literature on equal scale with a keen eye of an observer and without any prejudices. You have to be free from prejudices. So as we know that a critic must be free from prejudices, he must not have any preconceived notions. So a work of art or literature, whatever he is reviewing, whatever he is critiquing upon, should be read with an open mind. It should not be set up with any framework already faded in the mind. And continuing on this, I would like to give you two very apt definitions of criticism. So what Edison says about criticism, Edison says, quote unquote Edison, the true critic will dwell on excellencies rather than imperfections. So it's not necessary that the critic must only show out the imperfections of a piece of literature, but the critic or a true critic is someone who brings out the excellencies in any work of art. Another definition is from the English dictionary which says or which defines criticism as the art of estimating the quality and character of a work of art and the function or work of a critic. Unquote. So means you have to assess the quality and character of a work of art. That is the function of a critic. So after the introduction and we have understood what criticism basically is. Now we move on to the various ages of criticism. So as you can see on the screen, I have written all the names of the various ages and phases of criticism. And why it is necessary to know these? Because when you read any critic or any criticism, you must understand in what time it was written and what was the mentality of the critic and what was the backdrops on which such kind of criticism developed. So first we start from the classical criticism and obviously it is the ancient Greek criticism that we are talking about and the name which strikes us very first is Aristotle. He can be termed as the like backbone of criticism. Why? Because from he was the first who defended poetry. He was the first to defend read literature as something which is important for life because see Aristotle was the student of Plato and Plato was totally totally devoted to philosophies and mathematics although he was initially he studied poetry he studied literature but by using this word poetry basically uh, because earlier only poetry was the form of literature which was prevalent. So it was generally called poetry only and Aristotle's work Poetics which deals with tragedy and comedies and how tragedy should be written and how comedy should be written. It is all um, termed with the name Poetics. So that's why earlier only poetry was the word known for literature. That's why I'm generally frequently using this word poetry. So it's not just poetry, it's relating to any literature, literature, any form of literature that we talk about, be it novel, prose, fiction, whatever. So, uh, going back to Greek cla classes, uh, classical um, 
criticism when uh, plato was uh, too much into mathematics and too much into philosophies and he totally shunned the poets he said that poetry is of no use and basically such kind of arts be it fine arts painting poetry these are people who are of no use they must be banished from the state and he also said that they are twice removed from reality why because he says that whatever concrete is there that is idea the most important thing is idea anything which is of value of, of importance is idea so if there is some kind of idea in your mind that is important and that is in your mind that is uh, that is not concrete that is in the form of you can say uh, beyond this physical world but when you convert that idea into something concrete like a carpenter he imagines a chair in his mind that is his idea and then he shapes it into a chair so that is first removed from reality why because reality was that idea and what carpenter made was the replica of that idea and he uses this term mimesis for it mimesis the greek term mimesis means imitation so idea is imitated by the carpenter but poets and painters are even removed from reality why because what they will do if there it is a painter he will sketch a painting of that chair if there is a poet he will write a poem on that chair so they are imitating even an imitated object the chair is already one once removed from reality and when the poet and the painters are painting it or writing on it they are twice removed from reality so aristotle takes up the charges here and he defends poetry and he says that imitation is important mimesis is important because imitations gives you wings literature is the mirror of society it gives you uh, various kinds of thought processes in which you can imagine the fiction fiction is obviously not real it is imaginative but it has taken ideas from the society but it has also given back to the society various ideas have been given to the society through these literature and then he in his poetics on length goes on to describe how a tragedy should be written what are the various components of a tragedy what is the character of a tragic hero what is the root cause of the downfall of the tragic hero that he terms as tragic flaw or hamersia and because of one problem in the character although everything is good everything is best but because of one small flaw of the character there is the downfall of the tragic hero that is called hamersia and how that arises catharsis in the readers how readers are purged of their emotions while reading or stage seeing the stage of any tragedy so it gives you an overwhelming pleasure it purges you of all your negative emotions so whenever you see just for example if you see a drama a movie whatever it and if it is tragedy if it is sentimental uh, you cry you cry out your heart out but ultimately it gives you a soothing feeling at the end and it makes you tune with the life and it makes you understand so many things about life that even if there are hardships in your life how you survive how you go on carrying it so this is how aristotle defended poetry in the classical era so that was uh, basically when we are talking in about 4th century ad now we move on to renaissance when it was renaissance time and when renaissance writers were writing then also poetry was accused and abused so stephen gosson gosson was a writer who wrote school of abuse and he again in that shunned up all the poets and um, said that poets are of no good use and all those things so there comes sidney and sir philip sidney and he defended poetry in his defense of poetry and uh, there he again establishes the necessity of literature necessity of poetry in our life then we come to the age of reason that is also the age of dryden again here dryden because at that time again english drama was basically attacked by 
French people and uh, Dryden takes up the stand and in a dialogue form he writes his essays on dramatic poesy and there he divides uh, four people are there and he divides all those four people in dialogue form and uh, defends English stage, English theatre and uh, what is the importance of classicism, what is the importance of French um, drama in our life and so many things. There is a whole discussion going on and again there he defends poetry. Then comes the romantic phase. In romantic phase again the vein of poetry was changing because Wordsworth then published with the collaboration of Coleridge in 1798 his lyrical ballads. They were rebuked at that time. Why? Because uh, their poetry was a bit different from the classical poetries. They were writing on nature, they were writing on common people, common theme, they were using blank verse which was not the general trend. So they were ridiculed and in the defense in 1800 when Lyrical Ballads was republished, the second edition of Lyrical Ballads was published, Wordsworth also added a preface, preface to Lyrical Ballads. That preface is the critical treaties of Wordsworth and there again he defines poetry. What is poetry? Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings and the emotions recollected in tranquility. So you see how in every age poetry is being defended, how in every age poetry is being redefined in a new way because in re age of reason Dryden redefines poetry in a new way defending the Elizabethans. Um, sorry, uh -huh, defending the Elizabethans and in the Romantic age again Wordsworth defends his uh, kind of poetry, the newer form of poetry which he and Coleridge was writing in his preface and then again Coleridge also writes Biographia Literaria and there he talks about fancy, imagination and all these various components and how because Coleridge used a lot of supernatural elements in his works. So he talks at length about that and at places where he differs from Wordsworth. There also he points out because Wordsworth says that there is no basic difference between the language of prose and language of poetry. But Coleridge, is, Coleridge says that no, obviously there is a difference between the language of prose and language of poetry. So see how in every age poetry is being defined and redefined and according to every writer the concept of poetry changes a little bit but the theme the motive remains the same that they are talking about something which is reflection of the society in which they are living they are actually literature is a mirror of the society as we say so they are talking about how the society can be re-represented in the form of poetry in the form of Haters. So now we move on to Victorian criticism. Again in Victorian criticism the most important name is Arnold and Arnold is established himself as a critic uh, and the most important thing is about his touchstone method where he says that how any work of art must be assessed by these components of judging them on a touchstone by comparing them from the previous great works of art and if they are parallel to it, if they stand next to those work of art then only it can be said that it is a good work of art. So there is always a touchstone for judging any new piece or version of art. Then we move on to the new criticism. Now this is very important because till now whenever any poetry was read it was read in the context of what was the age what was the author who was the author and uh, so many things the back backdrop of the poetry was also read but new criticism establishes that this fact reader response theory reader becomes important practical criticism arises here i richards comes here and he says that in practical criticism if a poetry is given to you and the age and author is not known how are you going to judge that poetry free from prejudices this is the real concept of a, a critic he must be free from any knowledge of the backdrop of the poetry who was the author when was the poetry written and then the real judgment comes out so that was the practical criticism concept established by ia richards and here only Eliot comes 
and Eliot says that poetry is not turning loose of emotion but an escape from emotion. Poetry is not turning loose of personality but an escape from personality. So you see how from Wordsworth we have shifted to this. Wordsworth is saying spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It means feelings must overflow. And Eliot is saying no, you have to curb your feelings. Author is just a catalyst where the reaction takes place. He is having no involvement in the reaction. He is just giving, he is just a bowl basically say where the mixture is being prepared but he is nowhere participating in that mixture. He is just like a catalyst which is there necessary for the reaction to take place but it is not any way participating in the reaction. That is the importance of a true critic. And then we move on to literary theory. Why literary theory is important? This is the basic trend which rose after the moderns were writing. New criticism came basically in 20th century. So we are talking about in 19th century. So basically we are talking about after that, after the modern era, the postmodern or the contemporary area that we are talking about. See, theories are basically a bit different from criticism. Why? Because till now criticism was it was talking about poetry, how to judge a poetry, defining a poetry, redefining a poetry. But theory is new own strain of thoughts. So structuralism, Marxism, post-Marxism, feminism, orientalism, deconstruction, Derrida's deconstruction, all these things come in the category of theory. So it is altogether a new varied and vast branch which can be read separately. So why I have given you this timeline you see because I have not mentioned the dates exactly exactly why because with the names it's well evident that if I am talking about classical era it is in the 4th century AD if I am talking about renaissance it is after uh, the it is after the capture of Constantinople it is after 1453 it is during the time of Elizabethan period, the Romantic period, the Victorian period, it's all known. So I'm not giving you the exact date lines. I'm just giving you a like a genesis of how criticism started and how it developed and how it took shape, how various critics were responding to their work as a critic. What are the importance? What is the importance of criticism and what is the importance of reading a poetry? Rereading a poetry, the reader's response to the poetry and basically if poetry is important or not. So these are all the sum up of what criticism is and now I will make certain other videos also about the most important critics and the critics which are prescribed in your course. So we will cover up all the critics Richards, Pete Richards, Arnold, Eliot, or um, the ancient maybe uh, Plato, Aristotle, so I would write in. So I would like to uh, take up one by one all these writers and we'll discuss about them. So that is all for today. I hope you would have understood what is criticism and what are the various waves of criticism. This was just an introductory lesson to criticism. We will take up each and every critic in detail. Uh, till then, thank you.